So Yip, I know that you've shared with me a few times about your vision uh, for, for the future, and we've touched on it a little bit more here, but do you want to paint a picture and maybe tell a story? It could be imaginary or not of what you see this technology bringing. You know, Bridget, I was thinking maybe we can do a little experiment all together with all the participants in the room. Can we get like two minutes of visualization exercise 100%. for everybody to join into this? And of course, I'm happy to share my own 2030 picture. So it was just an invitation for you guys to lean back, find a comfortable position. And then if you want, you can close your eyes. We're going to just tap into our immediate intuition. Okay. So bear with me. It takes just a few minutes. So if you want to close your eyes, that's fine. If not, just find a relaxed gaze and then sense into your two feet and two feet on the floor and just feel how they connect to the ground. And then you guide your attention towards your breathing and see how your spine moves along with your in-breath and your out-breath. Pay attention to your belly and see how it moves when you breathe in and how it moves when you breathe out. Relax your shoulders. Do a quick scan of your face and see if you have any tension. And then focus on the chest area and connect with your heartbeat. If you like, you can Put the two palms together and feel the warmth of your fingertips and the riches in your fingertips as the, the hands press together and tenderly. Listen to your heart and then put yourself into 2030. And you wake up in the morning. You had a very good night's sleep and you feel good. And then you open your eyes and look around. What are you seeing? Wherever you are. And who are you with? In that very moment. And then you just reflect on the really cool things that happened in 2030 so far. Like, what a really good news. And then you think about the past five years. What were the major developments that have happened that made you feel very happy and that made you feel very safe and connected to your beloved ones? And then you think of how you got there. What has actually changed in this world compared to 2021 when there was this thing called blockchain or internet of value? What has actually really changed within the past 10 years for you? And now listen to your heart again and ask yourself, what was my contribution to the shift? What were my actions and how did I contribute? You just take a mental note of whatever comes up and then bring a sense of kindness and joy to you being here in the present moment and imagining your future, knowing that you can have empowerment to take action. And sense into your two feet again, wiggle your toes and then you can come back and open your eyes. And then you can maybe share in the chat, whatever came up, if you like, I can share what I think, how my world looks like in 2030. Very cool. I just want to hear. <laughs> and also Eleanor or Sam or Richard, <laughs> do share. <laughs> Let's hear from you first, Yep, and I'll happily share from, from me as well. Okay. I'm just seeing if something is coming up from the audience. So in 2030, I think I'm waking up in a world where I feel happy because I can choose where I'm working and how I'm spending my day. There's no nine to five job commitment, but I'm managing my day according to energy and flow. I'm living in a world where it's quite normal for people 
to engage with technology for women alike and for men and where there's actually an understanding that taking well-being for others um, in society like the care work you mentioned before is as valuable to the well-being of like society as any role working in tech or in finance so that everybody can actually get paid for and make a living of what they care most about and if that about like, taking care of beloved ones then so be it because everybody else knows that if we don't do these things we don't feel good in society and we got there in my view when i look at my own vision for 2030 because as a global society we used wisdom and insight we looked at what was meaningful to us and prioritized how we want to spend our 24 hours of the day and work together to figure out like the problem we want to solve in our little groups in our little network and work together with other networks to create the change and to contribute toward um, creating the world we want to live in that's amazing somebody said they were not on this planet <laughs> no i like that i woke up in a home that clearly wasn't in the uk i was in a much more pleasant climate there was a lot of nature around and I had the sense of freedom that when I was making any consumer choices that I was able to do so in a way that I knew that I was buying without damaging the planet or and making sure that the people in the supply chain had been rewarded fairly for what they were doing. And as a result, we were filled with a world of abundance, but not with a world of greed. And that's making me cry. And the part that I had played was what I'm looking to do with the bigger pie, which is to make sure that I can facilitate and support the amazing game changers that we have to be able to go off and to create these incredible futures for us. Somebody else has to speak now because I am going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm excited about the technology, because this is what I think we can do. We can solve the problems that we're currently in and we can imagine a future. And by collaborating and working together and the technology allows us to do that, as you said, the peer to peer, the permissionless aspect of being able to do and to do good. Now, with that means the permissionless aspect to be a bad actor as well. So it's not a perfect society by any measure, and there'll be lots of challenges that we'll have to face and come along with. But thank you very much for that exercise, Ian. I was going to ask each of you to share how people can get involved with cryptocurrencies and blockchain space. But to be honest with you, I think that we should go to the questions and how you can get involved. I mean, obviously, you all have your educational spaces. It's something that we can put in the email. So rather than using the time to be able to share that part of, of the journey today, let's go through the questions. I know, Eleanor, you saw that Chandan has asked a couple of questions that he'd love you to answer. Do, do you want to kick off with those? Yeah, of course. I'm still dreaming of me in 10 years <laughs> I also need some time to come down yep that was so surprising and beautiful what a beautiful exercise and thank you both of you for sharing your future I did see myself with kids jumping in a bed so that's where I went so I just <laughs> dropped crypto for a moment and I went all <laughs> family so let me grow back to crypto I saw a great question earlier indeed by Chandra and let me just scroll back the question I'm going to answer, what would happen to people possessing crypto in countries where uh, governments might ban it? Now, isn't it more a problem for them? So exactly for that reason. It's difficult right now, and I would say that governments and regulations do fluctuate. Governments are a bit undecided on what to do with it. On some level, they realize it threatens their system. They want us to all continue to use fiat so they can trace what we're buying and spending. And they want the central banks to stay relevant. If we're all like on another spreadsheet, then what are they doing? So at the same time, I feel like in those countries where there is so much 
financial grasp or where the government has so much power on your finances would make me want to crawl out of my skin and find alternatives uh, as fast as possible. What I might do in that situation would be to focus on privacy coins, focus on making sure that I'm as anonymous as possible, buy peer-to-peer, don't KYC yourself on centralized exchanges, make sure that you always own your private keys, make sure that you're using products basically that are designed in the true spirits of the cypherpunks to give you full privacy and control over your digital assets. That's my two cents on governments and crypto. And then there's a second question. If crypto or Bitcoin was made for everyone and bypassed the central banking system and fiat currency, how come it has become money for the rich and not actually available for everyone? Great question. I think today, anybody that's transacting and using cryptocurrencies might feel the burn when they realize that they need to pay fees, right? Whether it is miners for the Bitcoin network or gas fees for the Ethereum blockchain, There's a cost to using these blockchains. They're like very fancy clubs right now. And the bouncers, miners, validators asking for crazy entrance money, basically for for you to use these systems. And it's one of the reasons why I usually give Bitcoin Cash to people during my classes, because it remains very cheap to send, like a fraction of a cent. It is still a UTXO based blockchain, meaning that you still can obfuscate and use mixers for your transaction and you still can use HD wallets, et cetera. So yeah, it's not cool. (laughs) The situation right now is just not optimal. Let's just put it that way. We're in like a space where it's 99% speculation, 1% values and and use cases. So I, I want to tip that balance. So let's see like in 2030, if it can be more crypto for all and not just crypto for a few. True, but then you don't have to own a whole Bitcoin, right? This idea of also one unit, you know, the value's come up. So I need less of a Bitcoin to be able to, to hold a hundred pounds, if a hundred dollars, you know, if it was a hundred dollars at one, but I can still hold a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. So yeah. there is that element to it. And that was part of the design, right? That you yeah. could go down to the small Satoshis. Thank you, everyone. Do keep sharing your visions for 2030. We'll have a chance to to have a look at those. And now, because everyone's sharing everything, which is wonderful, I'm kind of losing sight of where the questions are. So question one and question two was answered. Bettina, are you still here? Do you want to ask your question? In your teachings, are you informing students? Did you want to come on and ask that question? No. My question was in regards to if your course, are you informing them of decentralized exchanges i think you answered my question a bit eleanor but how are you doing that in lebanon too because i'm wondering and you know because there are decentralized exchanges that does not require kyc but as there is a major learning curve like the bisque and then the running of the node that's another thing. So how does that work for those who are in places that, you know, may have trouble obtaining some of the cold storage, Raspberry Pi? I mean, they could break a couple of <laughs> computers and create their own, but I'm just trying to understand how you're able to go around uh, some of the issues, because those are what really will help, you know, really provide I guess what the woman was saying in regards to the fee situation how do you get around the system in regards to also ensuring that if the government bans some of the exchanges you have these alternatives yeah great question I think you've touched on so many technical aspects on the crypto 101 I don't tell people to run their own nodes. I think that the decentralization of the network is great for those that are ready to run a node. I'll talk about it more like in my crypto deep dive, like in like the more advanced classes for the beginners and how I do it is that I really insist on not your keys, not your crypto. So when I onboard these people, I give them a non-custodian wallet. And I've checked with Edge and I was asking them, what happens if the Apple store or Google store bans you? What happens then? And he was like, well, people can still run an SDK. They can still run it directly and run it directly on desktop. 
So it's a wallet that allows people to have privacy. It's an HD wallet. So I mentioned it before, meaning that every time you receive a transaction, your public address changes. So I think that's great. I don't want people to just have one public address. I mean, that's a problem with Ethereum, which is not a TXO model, but, but to have their private keys, I don't let them get out of their class without them knowing where in the app to swipe and click and write them down. And this is a paper wallet. And, you know, to write those words down, to ideally make sure that you keep those words like in a safe place, make copies, think about it. Imagine yourself in 2030 finding that piece of paper. Don't put it on a post-it somewhere <laughs> weird, you know, like just think long-term about these things. I don't want another like, oh, I'm looking for my computer hard drive and there's so many horrible stories like this. So basically beginners is all about private keys and ownership. And then the next step would be where to buy peer-to-peer -peer, on a decentralized exchange, et cetera. The node situation, running your own node, I keep that for like much later. But Edge, it's important. Yeah, so, Edge is an actual good app. So that's perfect. Oh, I'm, I'm glad I have a promotional link. Go check <laughs> no, it's a, but yes, they're great. Edge is, I personally use them. And, and I like the fact that they have zero data on you. That's also exactly. really important. So zero data on you, you have full ownership. It runs even though if they get banned or something weird because these governments, they shut down WhatsApp and Telegram on a whim. So you also have to think about these stores, these you know, closed gardens where you're telling people to go. That's how I do it. That's a very good point. We are past the hour now. I would love to hear just one last thing from Yip and Samantha and then Eleanor. Do you still wish to offer a bonus session for those who would like? So um, we're going to hear from Yip and Sam, and then I'll tell you about a little bonus afterwards. And final words from you. No, really, now is the time to shape the economy <laughs> and shape society because it's, we are in such early stage of the industry. And if you all speak up, and try to understand it. There's not too much to learn because it's so nascent, the industry, then you can really have a big impact on how we're designing it for the years to come and for future generations to come. If we believe technology is here to stay, then let, let's shape it. And I guess literacy is part of that. And that's exactly what you're offering through the unit passes course. And Sam, final words from you? Yeah, I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed by this space, even when you're in it. So I would say just remember how early it is and how much incredible power you have as an early player. I think all of us on the Zoom, whether you're a participant or a speaker, when I had that 2030 vision, I was like, wow, 2021 seems like so long ago, but everything we're doing now, we're really planting the seeds for massive, massive growth. So definitely acknowledge the power that you have now, the resources that are out there. I think, again, keeping up on things, even if it's in a light touch way, the Blockhead has a weekly newsletter. I'd recommend signing up for that. It's a quick read every week that just details, hey, what's happening? And I think by having that pulse on the industry, it makes it really easy to absorb the changes that happen. So, yeah, thank you for having me, too. I think this is such a fun panel. Amazing, like, meditation walkthrough. Um, super happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now.